Okay, before I get too far with the final wiring of the pulse width modulator circuit, I wanted to show you the completed front face panel. Uh, I've included a, a filler plate where the cigarette lighter jack used to be. And I have a six position, double pole, six throw rotary selector switch that I'll use to select the frequency ranges. And in my parts box, I also had some Born's potentiometers, 10 turn potentiometers, and calibrated dial indicator knobs. That will show me exactly where I am in rotation on a 10 turn pot. Inside here you can see the, the 10 turn pot from the back. All right, you get a good look at the, the um, rotary switch. And this is the completed printed circuit board for the LM324 pulse width modulator circuit. Now it's just mounted on a couple of standoffs. I've uh, allowed for a couple of uh, a couple of mounting holes on the printed circuit board. And I wanted to show you the bottom side. All I do to create this board, or I should say all I do, it's very time consuming, but it, I take uh, the extended leads of the components that I send through the boards and I literally wire them point to point and solder them. And any place that I don't have enough uh, component lead, I use salvaged wire from uh, telephone hookup wire. It's, uh, I think, 24 gauge solid copper wire. So it makes, it makes a very easy conductor to work with as I'm wrapping the board and putting it together. Now this this template that I've created is shown over here in the diagram that will be uploaded to zerofossilfuel.angelfire.com. This is a complete diagram viewed from the top of the board. I'll show you the board here. Orient it the correct way. All right, so that is a duplicate, and I show the external wiring to all of the pins on the edge of the board. This is the schematic diagram that I modified, and I included a complete parts list of everything that's included in this circuit. There was a gentleman on YouTube a while ago who sent me a uh, couple of part numbers for some components that he thought might be better suited to the next phase of experiments that I plan to conduct with microprocessor controller and voltage controlled oscillator. He had some part numbers that uh, integrated more of those devices into into one one chip. If that gentleman would kindly send me a personal message, I'd appreciate it. Um, I accidentally lost the previous message that he sent me and I can't find the parts that he was talking about but I would like to look into them further. Getting back to the box here, um, this printed circuit board obviously just mounts on the standoffs inside. It will get wired to the potentiometers and to the selector switch and of course in the back we have the power MOSFET that will send all of that pulse energy to the cells. Okay, the assembly is complete. Uh, Turn it around here. Give you a shot of the board and the wiring. And the connections to the power MOSFET. Now, I gotta tell you, it isn't very often that I put together a circuit and turn it on and it works the first time. Fortunately for me, Today was one of those days. I turned it on. It worked. I only had to make one small change to the schematic diagram to increase the frequency response of the circuitry. The maximum oscillator frequency that I seem to be able to get out of this circuit, right now anyway, is 40 kilohertz, um, which is pretty good. I mean, I can go all the way down from... Uh, one half hertz to 40 kilohertz, so I'm pretty pleased with that. 
The range selector switch works extremely well, and in just a moment I'm going to show you the output waveforms on the oscilloscope. Okay, what you're looking at right here is the output of the pulse width modulated device. Um, I've got a 50 ohm resistive load across it, and my scale is 5 volts per division. So you can see that um, at about uh, 12 and a half, 13 volts going coming out of it. And my sweep rate is 5 milliseconds per division. If I go to the lowest range, this is the second to the lowest range. If I go to the lowest range, you can see how slow I can pulse the cell. All right. That's the next range. There's the next range up beyond that. Now I'm going to switch ranges. That's half a millisecond per division. And if I gradually increase the frequency with the 10 turn pot, you can see the frequency going up. It looks as though I'm AC coupled right now. I don't know why. I'm at about 50% duty cycle on the adjustment knob. And if I turn it turn it down, you can see I can go to almost zero. And that is virtually 100% duty cycle without having any effect on the frequency. All I'm doing is changing the duration of the pulse. Now I'm looking across the MOSFET output right now. So when you see the trace go to zero, that is when the MOSFET is conducting. So this is virtually 100% duty cycle. And that's less than 10% duty cycle right there. If I go across the cell output, you'll see that waveform invert. Okay, that is across the output now. So I'm at a very, very low percentage duty cycle right there. And I can increase the duty cycle just by doing this. Turning it up. But the frequency remains rock solid because those two components of this generator are independent circuits of one another. The duration is being adjusted, or the duty cycle is being adjusted by a voltage comparator on a sawtooth generator. And let me go up to the higher, red, higher frequency ranges here. This is about as high as I can go. When I get up into the higher frequency ranges, I have to play with the, the duty cycle again to get it. Uh, to get it back into calibration. But this is 10 microseconds per division. And I'll increase the frequency as far as I can go. Right about there. And that's about as high as I can get it. But even at these even at these values I can adjust the duty cycle quite easily. Okay, that's it. That's the first dry run. I should say the second dry run because I did make one small modification to the LM324 pulse width modulation circuit. Next up, we put it on a cell.